making a Stuart model steam plant, this one is part 20. A closer look inside the steam chests to find out why the slide valves are not working properly, followed by cleaning the engine ready for painting. In this clip I've removed the cladding, but I'm refitting the small 6BA bolts just so I don't lose them. These are absolutely the last ones I have, in fact today I will call Blackgates Engineering and order some more. There's no time like the present, and I've just been speaking to the lovely Heather at Blackgates Engineering and the parts are on the way. So now I'm not quite so worried if I lose any of these small bolts. In the previous episode I investigated the possibility of using small bricks to make a plinth for the engine. And I'm just about to remove the engine from this horrible piece of softwood, but I must remember to take off the flywheel. I'll show you why. More about that later. Now I've removed the inlet and exhaust pipes, I can treat each side of the engine as a separate entity. So I want to see how it runs. This is compressed air at about £30 per square inch. One side of the engine seems to work sort of OK, but this one doesn't. The engine is very reluctant to start, and most of the air is just blowing to exhaust, so I think I know what's wrong with it. In fact, I would say that there are two things wrong with this engine as far as the slide valves are concerned. In this episode, I'll deal with the first problem. And that is, the slide valve is not machined at all. It's a tight fit on the crossbar, and the finish on the front face of the valve is unbelievably bad. This slide valve has had nothing done at it, it's just as it came out of the packet from the kit. You're supposed to machine this, or at least clean it up on some emery cloth. And a slide valve needs to float on the crossbar. Here I'm filing the gap to make it a little bit bigger, so that will then happen. It's not particularly laborious, a bit tedious perhaps. I do not understand the logic of screwing together a pre-built set of parts without doing a little bit of fettling on the parts that need them. I've had a good look round the engine, and the flywheel, the engine base and other things need a little bit of attention before I paint them. In this clip, I'm using some 400 grit wet or dry sandpaper to reprofile the face of the valve. And here's a good tip. For small jobs like this, rest your piece of sandpaper on a ruler, that's pretty flat. Before reassembling the steam chest, I'm applying plenty of lubricating oil to all the parts. I'm pretty sure that there's something else wrong with this valve, I wonder if you can see what it is. More about that in a future episode. I replace the steam chest in position, and here I'm refitting the pin that connects the eccentric rod to the valve fork, which in turn moves the slide valve. To prevent this pin from working loose, I'm tightening the lock nut at the rear of it. I haven't changed the timing, so theoretically it should work. It's still blowing to exhaust at each end of the stroke, but after a while it sort of bursts into life. No, it doesn't burst into life, it labours its way into life. I'll leave it for now and turn my attention to the other steam chest. Here I'm removing the securing nuts. And then once again I will remove the pin that holds the eccentric rod to the valve fork. Then I can withdraw the entire steam chest and have a look at the port face. And this doesn't look right to me. The port face isn't scored and more of the valve has been contacting this. It's time I think to look at this other slide valve and see how much better it is than the one you've previously seen. And the answer to that is... Not much really, it's still not machined, it's not cleaned up, it's just as it came out of the packet. I'm giving it exactly the same treatment as the other slide valve by filing the slot so it's a nice easy fit on the crossbar. And here once again I'm lapping the valve on a piece of wet to dry sandpaper on my ruler. Time now to refit the steam chest and refit the valve pin. I then turn on my compressor and get ready to connect the air. This side of the engine definitely runs better than the other side of the engine and that's why it's always a really good idea to time engines with individual cylinders. When the combination piping is attached to the inlet you don't know which cylinder is better than the other. When I connect compressed air to the cylinder at the flywheel end it definitely doesn't run as well as the other one did. And as I previously mentioned at the end of each stroke the air is blowing directly to exhaust. I can persuade it to run, but it's definitely not right. 
There are a few things wrong with this engine that I'm going to put right before I rebuild it back into a suitable engine for this very high quality steam plant. I didn't quote for all this extra work in the original price but the owner of the engine has sent me quite a lot of parts that I can sell to cover the cost of doing this. But I will not be selling the parts until I've finished the steam plant. It's time now to unscrew the engine from this very crude piece of softwood. You can clearly see the splits in the wood where the wood screws just split the wood. Here is a word of warning. An awful lot of Stuart double tens that I've worked on have had this problem. In my opinion, the design is completely flawed. And this is the reason that I've worked on a lot of double tens with bent crankshafts. The flywheel protrudes below the level of the box bed. And if you don't notice this and screw the engine down to a baseboard, you bend the crankshaft. To prevent that, for the further work I'm going to do on the engine, I'm removing the flywheel. Now the box bed sits squarely on the bench. I need to degrease the engine, so now I put it in a polythene tub and pour gun wash all over it, which is lacquer thinner or cellulose thinners. Trying really hard not to put my fingers in the gun wash because you're not supposed to do that, I'm using a paintbrush to persuade it to go into all the nooks and crannies of the engine. Then I left it for 24 hours in this position. The inner part of the workshop with the door shut is not a good place to do this. When using powerful solvents, you definitely need to work in a very well ventilated environment. Now I'm in the outer part of the workshop with the cladding. I've rubbed down both pieces of the cladding, it's time to give them a coat of etching primer. And for this, as usual, I'm using high build etching primer. I like to use this high build etching primer because automatically more paint is deposited on the work at every pass. Some etching primers need to be put on very thinly but this stuff doesn't and it's from Auto Paint Northern and the numbers and details are on the can. And for the viewer who commented that he didn't like to see me painting because I do it wrong, to further stress that it's called high build etching primer, that's why I put the arrow there. And I will say to this viewer, please make a video about it so I can learn from you. I promise to try harder next time. I don't know how I've managed to get through my life so far by painting my models so badly. And on that note, I'm going to end the video here. Please stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.